Um, I'd like to show the video that we recently did uh, this last February, March in Antarctica. And it really does, it's more about the whole earth, but of course going to Antarctica, what we think is the last pristine continent, um, you know, that's changing very quickly. So there's a lot of emotions going on in our, on our planet. And um, I'd really like to show, show this video and then maybe we can do a little discussion after that. We think of wild places as being pristine, as if our choices have no effect. But the reality is, we put over 12 million tons of plastic in our oceans every year. And because of that, one out of every three fish we eat has plastic in its body. Even though microplastics are a really new field of study, every food system that we've looked in, every habitat that we've looked in, every water source that we've looked in contains microplastic pollution. We can't see so much of what's happening in the ocean. We need science to see that for us, to tell us what's happening. The only way to get control of the problem is to begin trying to understand it. We're on the National Geographic Explorer. We're headed to the Drake Passage, and in about two days, we're gonna be at the Antarctic Peninsula. This is a really innovative trip. Tighten these down. The purpose of this expedition is to study microplastic transportation and concentration throughout the Antarctic Peninsula to help fill in some of the knowledge gaps in the field of microplastics research. I met Abby Barrows several years ago. She asked me to take samples of water from all over the world to bring back for her to test for microplastics. I first heard about microplastics in 2012 and a light went off for me. I couldn't believe that the waters that I grew up on were filled with plastic. Everything had been touched by plastic pollution. I've been conducting microplastics research since 2013. With adventure scientists, we were able to sample in all of the world's oceans, but there was absolutely more need to get samples from the polar regions. Abby's doing the first microplastic air sampling in Antarctica. We're out here collecting the microplastic samples to build the model for our future algorithm. Josh recognizes the potential of the machine learning and has the technological skill set to facilitate this data capture with Abby. And after seeing that my skills as an explorer, as a professional climber around the world can actually help science, it really ignited that organic enthusiasm. And this expedition is no exception. It makes me feel like I have some meaning and purpose to put this expedition together. From okay, thank you. My name's Jennifer Kingsley. I've been working in Antarctica as a guide for four years. Antarctica is the closest I think most of us will ever get to going to another planet. And it is a place that feels unchanged, even though we know it's changing all the time. For most of the people who come here, it's really a once in a lifetime experience. 63.11.55 West, time is 8.36. I met Jennifer Kingsley several years ago. It was really nice to reconnect with Jenny on this trip because she's been an integral part of our teamwork. This is a total dream trip. Never thought I would have the opportunity to come to Antarctica and to be able to ask these research questions that are begging to be asked. Can you tell I built this myself? <laughs> We want to experience Antarctica as a place that is untouched and that has no human footprint, but that's simply not the case. When we see whales, when we see seals, these are populations that are in recovery. This is a place where 
wildlife were hit hard by people in the past. Flotillas went to the Antarctic as to war to kill the blues. These scenes record the destruction of an irreplaceable resource. Now, for commercial purposes, the blue whale is an extinct animal. There are reminders of the whaling industry all over the place down here. It's not difficult to find a beach that's covered in whale bones. As much as we come here for a wilderness experience or something that's really beautiful and amazing, we need to know that we also have the power to impact it heavily. Not only do we have that power, but we've done that. We've already done that. My fear is that these seemingly pristine beaches will have the remains of our plastic misuse and the environment will never be the same. We need everyone involved in science. The more different kinds of people we see in science, the more interesting and better questions we're gonna ask. We're on James Ross Island, which is actually really remote, even for the peninsula. Not many people come here. And we're standing on moraine, actually rock and dirt. This used to be a huge glacier, and it's a testament and evidence that climate change is very real. Since this is the first of its kind research on the Antarctic Peninsula, I was so eager to plug in my microscope and have a look at those samples. One way to think about the bioaccumulation of microplastics in the food chain is to start with the plankton. A plankton ingests one piece of microplastic. A krill eats a hundred plankton. A fur seal comes along and eats a thousand krill. An orca comes and eats 10 fur seals. So by the end of its life, that orca could have consumed millions of pieces of microplastic. This is an incredible opportunity this morning. We're in the South Shetland Islands. You can see behind me hundreds of chinstrap penguins, if not thousands. We're doing machine learning with facial recognition on these penguins, using edge technology to better analyze data and provide more insights for research. It's one thing to have this great technology to work with in the field, but it's equally as important to communicate with my family. Hey, Aya, you want to tell me what you're doing? My daughter is always at the forefront of my mind. Okay, I love you, baby. I don't want my daughter to grow up in a world full of plastic pollution. I don't want microplastic research to even be a field of research. During the course of this expedition, we were able to take 18 samples on board the ship, 24 water samples, and 38 air samples. I'm hoping that we will gather a snapshot of microplastic transport and concentration along the Antarctic Peninsula and the Drake Passage. If I can bring those stories back and share these with people and they can feel the emotion, I really think that's a big part of the teamwork to change our planet, to get people to care. It's really important for people to become more aware of how their actions as consumers are contributing to the global budget of plastics in our oceans. To think about the world through her project, looking for the things that she's looking for that we can't actually see, has given me a new perspective on the unseen. Now is the time to act to protect our planet and prevent further damage. We can vote with our dollar. We need to think about policy. We need to think about extended producer responsibility models and really think how we can make changes quickly so we can stop pollution at its source. All of our little actions to stop plastic consumption add up and can create a tidal wave of change. And change is absolutely imperative now if we don't want a future choked with plastic pollution. There's no reason to wait any longer because the oceans can't wait. <laughs>